Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Jason Freeman. I'm a producer and editor here in the Author Events Office. Tonight is my pleasure to introduce uh, four people. Uh, Hannah Tinty, Mira Jacob, uh, Jai Chakrabarty, and Marie Helene Bertino. Hannah Tinty is the author of the best-selling novels The Good Thief and The Twelve Lives of Samuel Hawley and the short story collection Animal Crackers. A creative writing professor in New York University's MFA program, she is the co-founder of the Siren Land Writers Conference and the co-founder and executive editor of One Story Magazine, which I'm sure a lot of you follow, as do I. Uh, Jai Chakrabarty's debut novel, A Play for the End of the World, was selected as one of 2021's best books by numerous periodicals. Formerly an emerging writer fellow with a public space, he has had his Pushcart Prize winning short fiction anthologized in the O. Henry, uh, the o. Henry Prize stories and the best American short stories. Marie Helene Bertino is the author of the novels Parakeet and 2 a.m. at the Cat's Pajamas and the story collection Safe as Houses. Uh, a creative writing teacher at NYU and the New School, she has earned the O. Henry Prize, the Pushcart Prize, and fellowships from McDowell, Sewanee, and the Center for Fiction. And she's from Northeast Philly. Big shout out to Northeast. All right, yeah, there we go. Uh, Mira Jacob is the author of the celebrated novel, The Sleepwalker's Guide to Dancing and Good Talk, a memoir in conversations. A teacher at NYU, uh, the New School, and Randolph College, her articles, drawings, and short fiction have been published in the New York Times, Book Review, Tin House, and Literary Hub. They all join us tonight with one thing in common, and that is, well, many things in common. They're great writers, but also uh, with Small Odysseys, Selected Shorts presents 35 new stories, uh, edited by Tinty and published in partnership with the Selected Shorts literary radio program and live show. It presents never-before-published short stories by some of contemporary fiction's most acclaimed authors, including the ones I just introduced to you. A book list review proclaims, lovers of the short story rejoice. There's something for everyone in this anniversary collection. And it goes on to say that it makes an argument that time and again, it is stories that save us. Amen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Hannah Tinty, Mira Jacob, Jai Chakravarti, and Marie Helene Bartino. Um, my name's Hannah Tinty. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, and I'm so glad you three are here as well. How's AWP going for you so far? <laughs> Kind of overwhelming, <laughs> but also awesome. Yeah, no, it's good. Um, so how many people here are also taking part in AWP? Okay, yeah, a good, a good proportion. Hi, hi, um, good to see you all. So um, I'm gonna start by just talking a little bit about, um, about Selected Shorts and about why, you know, this book, how this book came together. So how many people here in the audience have either been to a Selected Shorts show or heard it on the radio or a podcast? Yeah. Okay. So about like a quarter of you have. So, um, so this, 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 it's an interesting story um, and it's an important one um, about how Selected Shorts came to be. And it all started in, uh, the first program was actually in 1985. So it, it began, uh, there's a theater on the Upper West Side on Broadway, 96th Street, called Symphony Space. And they do all different kinds of programming there. Um, but one day, <clears throat> they were celebrating um, Bloomsday and doing a marathon reading of James Joyce. And they decided to read some of James Joyce's short stories from Dubliners. And Kay Catarula, who was working there at the time, um, leaned over to Isaiah Sheffer, uh, who is one of the founders of Symphony Space, and said, actors reading short stories on stage. <laughs> um, wouldn't that be amazing? And Isaiah always jokes that, um, or used to joke that, you know, he's like, nobody will go to that. That's a stupid idea. And then, of course, it became this huge um, phenomenon. So it's this idea of taking short stories and having amazing actors um, performing them on Broadway. And they would record them. And then it became a, um, a program on NPR. Um, and it is, you know, it's still, you know, it's broadcast on, I think, 180 different stations um, across America. It's become a podcast um, and also a traveling show. They, they do performances all over the country with different actors. 
And it's just an extraordinary um, organization. And I became involved in 2010, um, where I was hired as the, um, they called me the literary commentator, but I always say that like my real uh, title was Isaiah's sidekick, um, where I'd, he'd be like talking and I'd be like, da, 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 like over to the side, um, <laughs> sort of helping him out. But what I got the chance to do um, was interview authors and sort of talk about the stories beyond just the recordings themselves. And that was, that was really, really special. Um, and I, I'm grateful for the time that I, you know, sort of spent in the program. So um, when on, when Selected Shorts approached me with this idea of putting together an anthology of stories to celebrate the 35th anniversary of Selected Shorts and kind of bring new attention to it, I was really excited by the idea because oftentimes when I would listen to the radio program, I would then go look up those short stories or buy those collections of those authors because I'd want to actually read it again, you know, like listen to it, listening to a story is one thing, but then you want to read it, you want to see the text as well. So I was like, this is a great bridge between the written word and the performance of the stories. So that is what we are doing here today. Um, the book just came out, it's really beautiful. See how pretty it is? Um, and when we open this up to questions in about 30 minutes or so, um, the first person to ask a question is going to get a signed copy of the book. So you get, you know, 20, 30 minutes to think of a really good question. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a contest and I'm gonna go one, two, three, and I don't know, who wants to be the judge? Maria. Marie. <laughs> <laughs> How about the two of you are the judge between the two of you? Then you're like, you know, come. And then the first person to raise their hand will win the prize. Okay, so you'll get a free book, um, all signed by every, all of us. So that's going to be um, super, super fun. Um, when, so I wanted to just, you know, the, the exciting thing about this book is some of the people are names that a lot of you will recognize, and then some of them are new and emerging writers. So that's a great mix. For, for me, and that's one of the things I'm also sort of excited about. So I just wanted to start by um, talking a little bit about the organization of the book. And one of the reasons why we are calling it Small Odysseys is when we were talking about the concept of like, well, how are we gonna put this together? And what, what you know, how do we give it some sort of shape or feeling? And I've often thought that for me, you know, both as a writer, but also as, like, as an editor and working with so many writers over the years is like reading a story is about a journey that you know, the, you sort of take the hand of the writer and you sort of step into this new world together and you're like taken on this ride. Um, and so that's what I wanted to frame the book as. So we broke it into three sections. Um, departures, which is really stories about sort of parting ways or leaving the known world, um, you know, which I think is, is, is saying goodbye to things. Um, and then uh, journeys, which is people who are in transition, um, moving from one place to another. And then the final section is new worlds, which is sort of arriving to that sort of new territory and, and that unexplored place. Um, so while the stories are very different, sort of thematically, they're kind of you know, following some of the same route. So two of you are from Departures. <laughs> <laughs> you two are departures, yeah. <laughs> Jai and Mira are departures. Marie is um, in journeys. Um, so I thought we'd start with just each of you reading a very, very short piece, um, just to get a you know a sort of sound of those. And we'll start with the departure pieces. So and then move on to journeys. So Jai, you want to get us started? Yes. Yeah. So this story is about an artist finding a second life, and I'm going to read a paragraph sort of randomly from the middle of the story. I grew up in a country accustomed to death. It was no special privilege. So many of us witnessed riots, mothers dragged by their braids, skull caps burned, so many heads lifted onto pyres, and with all the vigor of public ceremonies set to flame. Still it's different when you see the slow unraveling Today, when I was drying him after his bath, my father handed me a tooth. It had come undone in the night, but he'd plied it in place for as long as he could, until finally he surrendered it into the warmth of my palm, a bit of his gum tissue still stuck to the dulled enamel. Beautiful. Um, is this on? Yeah? OK. This is uh, Death by Printer. The first time she finds Terry Fixit 303 on YouTube, Shilpa is near tears. The chemical stink of her jammed printer burns the air, and for a moment, she hopes this is it, the moment she'll begin to die in earnest. 
that in two years some pinch-eyed medical examiner will write down metastatic lung cancer, and in 70 more, people at dinner parties will moan they used printing cartridges back then. Sad for their dumber, earlier animal selves. Stealing my death, is it? She hears Azmat say, because this is the first survival skill Shulpa's mastered in the months since her wife of 30 years has died. The ability to hear things Asmat hasn't said. Her second survival skill is never saying anything back. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. I marked my page. Where is it? I think Mira unmarked my page. I'm here to thwart Marie. <laughs> oh, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. You didn't. Thank you. This is a story called A Woman Driving Alone. It's a story about friendship. Back on the dating scene, Gracie recently had dinner with a man that went so well, they spent hours at the restaurant laughing. He spent the night at her house. In the morning, she walked him to his car where she discovered he was keeping a large dog in a crate. The, car, the dog had been in the car hungry the entire night. She asked him to let the dog out, and he refused. He dismissed her protests, assuring her the dog liked it. Please tell me the crate was big enough for the dog to move around, I say. Gracie says, the entire night. Um, thank you so much. So you can sort of see, like, this, these stories are sort of, um, you know, approaching people at different times in their lives. Um, but I, before we get sort of digging into the stories themselves, I, I would just love, I'd love you each to talk about your maybe relationship with Selected Shorts. Have you had pieces performed by them? Um, what was that like? Yeah. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I moved to New York 18 years ago from here. I grew up in Philadelphia. And I had already been listening to Selected Shorts for a long time and taping them on cassette tapes and listening to them. And I have whole stories memorized from listening to them on the radio, um, the NPR station here. And then when I moved to New York, I could only afford to go to Symphony Space once a year. So I would always go to the Best American Short Story Nights and um, sit up on the balcony and like listen to actors read sh short stories and think like one day maybe that'll be me. And um, some days it felt way more um, impossible than others. Eventually, years and years later, it did actually happen. And I've had two stories now read on the stage at uh, Symphony Space. And um, and I was for one of them, I was actually in the audience. And I've never, I don't think I've ever experienced anything like hearing someone else read one of my stories on stage. It was, will forever be uh, a charmed and miraculous moment. Who was the person who read one of those pieces? Or An actor named Colby Minifee read my story, The Idea of Marcel, from my first collection, Save His Houses. And she was brilliant. And I just felt like she and I were just locked the entire time as she was reading. Um, my uh, relationship, so I have loved Selected Shorts forever, and in fact, one of the great um, moments in my marriage, you know how someone can sort of reveal themselves to you at an unexpected time? Um, whenever we're driving and we're listening to a story on Selected Shorts, my husband will always pull over and never turn off the car until the story is over, and it makes me love him again every time. I'm like, you get me, you get this, you know why we're in this. Um, anyway, and my and I have I have never had a story performed. I have loved them. I have memorized some. Some I listen to at night as a way to console myself um, when my day feels uh, kind of non-functional. But I will say that Marie, when I heard your story, when they announced that it was your story, I started screaming so loudly in the car that Jed had to pull over so I could just get a hold of myself because I was like, it was like a magical thing had happened actually to me. I felt like I had won some sort of lottery. And I was like, I know her. No, but I know her. <laughs> How about you, Jay? I love that. I totally want to be in a car when a story by Marie comes on. Um, so before I was a fiction writer, I was a poet, and 
I, I don't know, misspent my youth with spoken word poetry. This is maybe not a well-known thing but about me. <laughs> but, you know, like I... Not misspent. <laughs> not misspent. Yes, not misspent. Love poetry. Um, but, like, I began to have a great appreciation for the page as it was performed and how that could be a way to connect with readers and how that could also be a deepening into the revision process. Um, you know, and like I was, I had no interest in performing poetry myself until somebody told me, well, you know, that anxiety of being on stage lets you see something about your piece that you may not otherwise be aware of. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I had this deep appreciation for poetry and the study of performance of it. And I was like, wow, this does not exist in fiction at all. <laughs> um, until, until I got to hear selected shorts. And then I was like, this is incredible. This is that same kind of devotion to performance. Performance is a way to kind of, like, amplify the art form. And I've been absolutely hooked since. Like when they performed my piece, it was just, um, yeah, an incredible, incredible moment. So this is a question that I asked at the last event we did, which, which ended up having a surprising answer. But now that we have two writer, new writers, I want to ask the same question, which is um, all the stories included in this anthology were actually, we were, they were commissioned. So these, these writers were asked to write something specifically for this book. So I'm just curious, um, knowing that this piece was going to be performed, did you approach it in any different way? I will tell you that at the last thing that we did, everyone said no. They were just trying to meet the deadline. <laughs> so I'm curious if the two of you <laughs> did approach so, it differently. I will say the, um, the embarrassing thing, which is that I myself per, like perform every story out loud before I ever turn it in. Mm -hmm. I always read the story out loud fully and make sure that every sentence is clicking before I turn it in, regardless of where I'm doing it. So I, I definitely did that for this. OK, cool. cool. <laughs> so smart that you did that. I did not. I should have, and I did not. This was due in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah. This came up in the pandemic, and, and so I had a very interesting relationship with the world and writing at that point. I think I probably, I don't smoke, but I think I probably, like, <laughs> metaphorically was like, I will write the realest <laughs> story that has ever happened. And then later I was like, oh my gosh, somebody has to read that out loud. Someone has to read that in general is terrifying. So no, I didn't think of it. But at the same time, because I am a Selected Shorts fan, I know that they run the gamut. So you have like the really funny pieces by like Frank Rich, for example. And then you have like the Miley Malloy short stories that are more introspective and slow and quiet. And so I was just hoping against hope that, you know, who, you and the other editors would be like, oh, that's along that spectrum, the quieter spectrum. And thankfully you did. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. And, and Jai, do you want to add your thoughts? Uh, well, one thing that, that that Marie's comment triggered is that, you know, in the pandemic, I really was struggling in the beginning to write anything. Um, and, you know, I was reading a lot, but I just could not write. And so I think this was the first piece that I wrote that allowed me to start sort of writing again as, as a discipline. So like now thinking about, back about it, like I'm really grateful for it because it was like, you have to do it, there's a deadline, you have to turn something in. And you know, it sort of like allowed me to go past that point of paralysis. Mm -hmm. And you know, the pandemic's definitely in the whole book. I mean, you could feel it seeping into almost all, some of the pieces are talking about it directly, um, some indirectly or just sort of like approaching some of those feelings. Um, so well, but it's there, but I don't, you know, I don't think it's a pandemic book, but it, it, it is like, I, you can feel that tension, I think, with all the writers. And it was interesting watching them come in um, you know, um, back and forth. And I just want to say that um, this Saturday um, at Symphony Space, they are doing a marathon event um, called Wall to Wall where everyone's pieces are going to be performed. Um, they're doing, it's going to start at, I think, 11 o'clock in the morning and end at 11 o'clock at night. They're going to do like two to three hour segments. The whole thing's going to be streamed um, online. And they're going to, in between the readings, they're going to have um, performances of art, and movies and musical pieces and dance pieces that were all created, inspired 
by these stories. So it's going to be this wonderful sort of, you know, multi, you know, discipline uh, performance. So if anybody's interested in hearing um, some of these, I hope you tune in. Um, you can go to Symphony Space's website and just, you know, stream it. It's all free. Um, so that's going to be fun, and I will be there um, during part of the performance. But we've got great um, actors um, lined up: um, Cynthia Nixon, Anika Noni Rose, um, Tony Shalhoub, uh, Joan Allen, um, Lee Schreiber, um, Michael Shannon. It's going to be like Hugh Dancy. It's going to be just star-studded and, um, and and really, really, really fun. Um, so one thing that we decided to do when we were talking about the book and how to put it together was um, something that I really enjoy is, is knowing a little bit about the story behind the story, um, like peeking behind the curtain. So we asked each of the writers to basically do a contributor's note after the piece. So after you've enjoyed the story, you actually get a little bit of an insight into it. Um, and I really love that for each of you um, and you know what, what you sort of came up with. So. Like, Mira, um, you know, you talked about in your piece, um, reflecting on your story, this idea of, like, well, first of all, YouTube, but also <laughs> being alone in a revolution. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about that yeah. and how that sort of started the story? Yeah, so um, my piece is about a woman who's recently lost her wife, and she also, um, to be married in the time that she was married and to choose the partner in the time that she chose the partner was to go so wildly against the grain of her family that she lost the rest of her family before, right? So it's like you lose your family and then you lose the only person you've chosen as family. But there was also this idea um, for that, in that for me, where there's something amazing about deciding to make that choice together with a partner. There's something amazing about choosing to be in that revolution together. And that was specifically, that's what she's both mourning and it's the thing that is still kind of firing her up in some way, that's a very low hum at the beginning of the story, this kind of idea that like she's gonna survive this thing. And toward the end, it's sort of coming out of her, this idea that like, I was in this revolution. We were in this together. I lived through this incredible moment. Um, and it felt so good to be with her, honestly, in a moment where we were frozen it felt so good to remember how cyclical things are, how revolutions come and go, how we wander so far from our fighting selves and then come back and remember them. I just was, I felt like I was in stasis and it felt so good to feel like, right, this is, we have all been in a different kind of stasis before, mm -hmm. right? Um, thank you, thanks, that's really great. Um, and Marie, your piece is, you know, you wrote in your note about waiting and like sort of the power of waiting and also um, about an Agnes Varda film that sort of inspired you. Can you talk a little bit about that spark for you for the story? Absolutely. My, so the terrain of my story, A Woman Driving Alone, you realize throughout the story is that this woman is taking a solo road trip in, in the parenthetical expression of waiting for results of a really serious health test. Um, this reflects my real life because I uh, went through this and in the period of time, and I hope none of you know what I mean, um, in the period of time when you're waiting for results of serious health issues, there's a sense that you just don't know what to do with yourself. You know, everything feels really expanded and diminished and, con and, and time moves in a really odd way, both expanding and diminishing. And so the shape of the story then becomes the shape of her waiting and the shape of her fear. But the story itself is just about the road trip, you know? And so that's running along underneath the story. And I was very much thinking like, how we are when we wait, and who we are when we wait, when we are forced to do the thing that most of us hate to do, which is wait. Now, that was not meant to be a pandemic metaphor. However, it did turn out that it was. But the, the micro level of waiting for results uh, for a week or two, thinking about the collective grief of two years of a pandemic, turned out to have, like, you know, interesting ripple effects um, too with the story. Yeah, thanks, thanks. I, you know, it's so great reading the notes after you know each of the pieces. I feel like I, I feel like I enjoy the pieces as I'm reading, but then it was just like I sunk down in them and appreciated them on like a whole other level by having those contributors' notes. So, so Jack, can you talk a little bit about um, the inspiration behind your piece, which is a, a Derek Walcott poem? 
Um, and also, you were also writing from the point of view of, you know, of a woman. So talk a little bit about that. How is that, how is that as a challenge? Um, yes, and if folks don't know that poem by Derek Walcott, I, I, you know, it's one of my favorites. It's Love mm -hmm. After Love, which you know, could be construed as finding romantic love, but I think the way that I interpret it, it's really re-encountering the self. And you know, there's a line that says, there will be a moment where you look at yourself and find a stranger in the mirror. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's really about this awakening to the possibility of ourselves and like falling into love with ourselves. And um, you know, something that I do when I'm s sort of stuck is I go back to poetry and see if I can write a story in the shape of a poem. Um, and I, I feel like we don't do this in short stories very often. Like I, you know, like I think about maybe like Laurie Moore's referential, which tracks Nabokov's signs and symbols. Like, but like there's some examples, but maybe not that many. And but it's like a really helpful exercise for me. And so in this story, it's about a woman, a musician, a successful musician, who decides she wants to become a painter. Sort of later in her life, and her father is a very successful painter, and he's also dying. So it's this sort of uh, exchange that the two of them have, and she's encountering this new self, this awakened self of being, you know, uh, a painter, you know, after being a musician all her life. Thank you. Um, and, you know, was it hard for you to write from a woman's point of view? I'm just curious. Uh, so my default. Uh, consciousness is that of a middle-aged Indian woman. Um, so I will <laughs> we say, all have an inner self like that. I, I, that that's, I'm just being really honest. Uh, so like in my novel, there's a minor character, you know, who I just to, I had to rein myself in because I was like, I really want to write from her point of view for hundreds of pages. So I will say, no, that's the point of view that I'm most comfortable with. I, mine is a 50-year-old man. I was going to ask, what yeah. is yours? Yours is a 50-year-old man? 50-year-old 50, 50 criminal. That's, a, that's, that's my inner self. What's what about yours? you guys? Do you have an inner self, that, like a default person? Probably like a 12-year-old boy. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, I was like, this is why we get along. Mine's definitely an angry teenage boy, like for sure. <laughs> Uh, that's that's really fantastic. So so one of the one of the really cool things about this this uh, this anthology, um, you know, going through it, and for me, the joy was actually like seeing the pieces come in, and they were so different. You know, some are you know straightforward stories. Some are like written in the form of commercials. Some are written in the terms of um, translations of made up languages. Um, they just sort of run the gamut of like you know all over the place. They're funny. They're sort of sad. They're sort of touching. Some are some are very sort of complex. Some are like you know these almost like almost like prose poems, you know, like just these fractured moments. But, but for me, it, it felt joyful because it felt like the short story as an art form was like very vigorous, um, you know, with the diversity of the styles and the forms and the, and the things that people were writing about on the page. So I just would love to hear from each of you as short fiction writers, um, you know, what does a short story mean to you? Like, where do you see it going? Like, what are your feelings? About this. I have such big feelings about this. Yeah. I am sitting next to, I call Marie our lady of short stories, so I yeah. feel like I am sitting next to one of my favorite short story writers, but also, this is my first short story. Really? I know, so I, I didn't just feel know like that. I did it. Yeah, I hadn't done one before, and they reached out to me and said, would you like, it was sort of an audition, like, we know you don't do this, would you like to try? And I was like, yes, I would <laughs> like to try. And then I did, and then I panicked, like I sent it off and I ran in circles. And then I assumed it didn't get in because I was like, why would it? That wasn't a short story. I don't know what I was doing. <laughs> um, and I had read enough, sh I love short stories. I just had never done one myself. So when they wrote back and they said, we've accepted it, I was like, you did! Like, it was very surprising to oh, me. And then I kept wandering around for like a month being like, I wrote a short story. <laughs> just like anyone, people that didn't even like know me, I would just be like, me, a short story. What do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. I did not know that. Oh, my God. That's so cool. Uh, Marie, how about you? Oh, my gosh. I don't know. how. I can't follow that. That's amazing. <laughs> I wish this was my first short story. Um, you did, And you did such a brilliant job. And I think that's such a surprise to know that this is your first. If When you read Mira's story in the book, you you are going to be like, think that's it's her not first short your story. first short story. Don't be silly. What do short stories mean to me? Oh, my goodness. 
Well, so for six years I worked at One Story Literary Magazine, which is the magazine that Hannah co-founded and edits and is the editor-in-chief of. And um, I remember even one day we were working on something called, what we called a short story manifesto, which was ridiculous and ill-advised, and I don't think it went anywhere, but we were trying. Because it's a, it is one, it is an American art form, in addition to, you know, um, all sorts of cultures have written short stories in their own ways and have perfected the story in their own ways. And there's something, there's a sound, a particular sound of the short story that I just started hearing one day that I really loved when I was a writing student. And it had something to do with uh, writers like Lucia Berlin. Um, and it was just, it, it sounded more like poetry to me. And it was a space where I could really, really, really be myself. Um, I could be as weird as I wanted to. I could be funny and strange and honest. If any of you want to write short stories and never have, and are maybe scared in some way, like maybe Mira was before, really, really, I highly encourage you to just try it out because I think it's a form that really rewards honesty and whatever you bring to it, it can become and reward you in really exciting ways. So I'm... I'm I'm like a cheer. I'm a short story cheerleader. You are. No, that's great. How about you, Jay? That was an amazing blurb for short stories. <laughs> I have to say. Um, so, you know, what do short stories mean to me? Like, uh, so we would go to India for three months every year, like until I kind of graduated from college, and I would have a limited supply of books to take with me, and so I would always prioritize taking like short story collections because I knew it was gonna like you know. I was not going to have an easy time finding the books that I wanted to read. So, like, that's, it's for me kind of the first love. And I feel like short stories are in the ways in which the novel was maybe in its infancy, a home for verdant experimentation. Like, that's what I felt when I was reading these stories is that there are, like, so many vital experiments happening. And, which is not to say that it's not happening in novels, but... There's, I guess, I guess, a little bit of a sunk cost when you start to write a novel, and with a short story, you can really wander. You can try weird and strange and crazy things, and that's okay. Yeah, and you don't have to worry about sustaining it for like 300 pages. So, so it allows for, I think, more a, more of a sense of play, which is one of the things that I enjoy so much as a reader of short fiction. Um, I feel like you know, you, you get it also on like the first paragraph. You're like, oh, I see what they're doing. This is gonna be fun, you know, like like it's almost like a like a um like I'm an amusement park and it's a different kind of ride. Uh, and I and I just can't wait to for for the experience. Um I'm just curious, you know, this is something I didn't ask before, um, but is there like a particular short story that like sticks, you know, that like is your maybe you one you return to a, I know you can't choose favorites, oh. right? You can't choose favorites. It's like choosing between children. But it, maybe one that you read that knocks your socks off so much that made yeah. you want it. For me, it's like Sonny's Blues, um, James Baldwin's Sonny's Blues. Like, I, I just go back to it, I reread it. Um, it's, 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 it's just something that, that was really important to me. Is there one that... There's lots of also... Although the, I remember the first time I read... Um, I think it was high school, I read uh, Flannery O'Connor, you know, A Good Man and It's Hard to Find, and I was like, What? They just kill everybody in the end. Sorry, spoiler alert. But I was like, I was like, what? It was like, I was just like, I was like, you can do that. I really loved. Um, I when I was in high school, somebody handed me um, *Lust* by Susan Mino, and I had never in my life read anything like that. And I remember reading it and like being so moved. I had to turn it over and sit with it like it was a person. Like, I couldn't leave the room and it couldn't leave the room until I was ready to turn it back over and read it again because I was so surprised. I was so surprised that something could say that much. And then the other short story that I reread all the time is um, In the Gloaming. It is just so, it's just so beautiful. It's just so beautiful. Lust is such a great, great book. And, and I, I read it and then she came to, like, my school. Yeah. And I just remember being just so freaked out like that I couldn't I mean what a stupid thing you know please like go up to writers that you read their stuff and enjoy and just like tell them I was too nervous to go up and say how much I loved it 
Um, I always just try to do that now or write somebody when I do read something because it's just, you know. But yeah, I do feel like I would understand that because I do feel like the, my love for that story is so much that even now, I feel like if I were to go up to her, I'd be like, I love it! And it would just be awful. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it wouldn't be sophisticated at all. It would just be a bunch of, like, noise and delight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How about you, Yesman? Any, any stories? Oh, um... By the way, like lust and in the globing, they're like the two ends of the spectrum. I love that. Um, I I don't know. I like I I, I don't want to pick favorites, but like I, I will say that. Um, so one writer who I think I really did not appreciate in the beginning was William Trevor. Like I felt, you know, almost angry. Like why am I not getting this? And he, you know, he's become one of the writers that I now reread over and over again because there's just like so many layers in his stories. Um, so I guess, yeah, I guess he's he's the one for me right now. That makes me want to go back and reread William Trevor, because I don't think I was ready the first time I read him either. I just realized sitting here that when I was truly introduced to short stories and the sound I was talking about was actually in college, um, we had a brilliant professor, Dr. Lucky, who came to Villanova uh, for her first year and taught uh, the history, the African-American short story. And she gave us a packet of short stories. I think that was the first time I studied, maybe even read, short stories. And um, I still have the packet, and I teach from the packet today. Because it was, so, I knew that I was learning something that would change my life and change the way I hear. One of those short stories was Toni Morrison's Recitatif, which is um, her first and only, I think, published short story in her lifetime. Mm -hmm. And that story is so brilliant. You can find it online and forever revealing itself. So I just, you know, when I started, when I started teaching and I thought, okay, now what, am, what is my packet going to be? I went back to that story and thought, is this going to stand up? And I, um, it more than stands up and it continues to deepen in its brilliance. And um, I, it, taught me how to hear in a certain way that I wasn't quite ready for in college, that it would take me years, years, and years to really understand. Thanks. Those are great. Like, like I've got like this reading list. I want to go back and reread all these stories. Um, Hi. Hi. I'm excited to win that. Um, <laughs> my question is, what makes a short story stand out to you? Like, as a reader, when you read it, what do you look for? for it to really stick with you, like what makes you remember it? Mm. Um, you should, yeah. I'm gonna just give you your prize, come get it. Hooray. Thank you for that. Yeah, what do you guys think? I can talk a little bit about that just in terms of being a, having read Slush for 20 years, actually more than that at this point. I think I've been reading Slush for 25 years. Will you tell us what Slush is? So Slush is any unsolicited manuscript that is sent into a magazine, um, a literary agency, or a publishing house. So, um, and I'll describe it this, like the very first job I had was like the Slush came in, it was before people submitted stuff over the internet, and it was like people would just send it in a manila envelope. I know that's like ancient times, but, um, and uh, the, the, the magazine I worked for like had like, you know, as all that mags had like, you know, like a, a tiny little like hovel in the back of a sweatshop, you know, in, in um, Chinatown in downtown Boston. And like we had to like lock ourselves in and like lock ourselves out. It was like this one room and they like literally brought me back and there was a closet and it was like, ee! and like it was piled to the high with manila <laughs> envelopes and they were like, read those, that's your job. So I'd like read, read hundreds and hundreds of stories a day. Um, and then we do that, but now virtually um, at one story. And for me, um, the most, you know, when you read, when you're, it's kind of like panning for gold, you're just like reading, 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 reading. Um, and the first thing I notice is language, I would say. Um, what's happening? Um, how quickly is the writer, um, is the writer um, in control of what's going on? And it's a little bit like, you all know what it's like to get into a cab or something, or be, or maybe not a cab, maybe someone you know, get into a car with a really bad driver, and you just get really, really nervous, and you're kind of like, you're holding the oh, oh shit handle, right? And you're like, nah, and you're like, oh wait, are they lost? Like, where are we going? I'm, I'm, I'm a little nervous. Like, am I gonna lose my life? Like, you know, what's, you know, you just can't relax versus being with like a really good driver, where you go in and you just like, you're like, oh, I feel like, 
all right, I'm just going to like look at what's outside and like kind of enjoy this trip and not worry. That's, that's like sort of, that's the physical difference between reading a story that is under control and one that is not under control. So, um, and by that I mean like how quickly do I know what's happening, who's important, um, what level is the language, how much is happening you know, in each paragraph like that's moving me through it. Um, this matters so much for short fiction. I mean, it's different for novels. Um, I enter a novel in a different way than I enter a short story. So that's sort of like, that's my beginning. But what, what do you all think as readers? What's important? I'll, I'll tell you a few quick things that are pretty practical. And obviously, it, it uh, depends on the project you're working on and your particular style, which I can't possibly know. But I will say, um, what I tell, what comes up at, again and again in my classes with students would be, um, I notice, getting in as late as possible to when the action is actually occurring and getting out as early as you can. So short story rewards economy mm -hmm. and it rewards um, anomaly, just like fiction rewards an anomaly, the thing that is unlike any other thing, the woman who is unlike any other woman, the year that was unlike any other year, which I think is why many of us love fiction because it rewards those of us who have never felt like we belonged. Um, short stories, so what else? Um, for me, it is that my expectation, whether I knew I had it or not, is upended about something. Um, and that's hard for me because I have a lot of expectations. And I'm always reading toward what is it going to do? What is it going to do? If you can surprise, if I can be surprised or if my expectation is upended, I'll go a long way for that author. Like I will just, oh, forever. If the um, dialogue is beautiful and evocative instead of representational, I love that you're taking notes right now, by the way. <laughs> you are after my own heart. Um, I love that so much. Um, that it's, and um, what was the final thing? Obviously, definitely the language. Oh, that's, and this is the last thing I'll say. That something that is invisible in the beginning becomes visible by the end, whatever that means to you. Something unseen in the beginning becomes visible by the end. That's a great quote. Absolutely. Everybody should write that one down. Yeah. <laughs> or just yeah. borrow her notes. Okay. No. <laughs> yeah. Any other thoughts on that? As terms of being a reader, what's important to you when you read a short story? I think that last one is really the one that I, yeah. I gravitate toward most. And then it's one of those, for, oh, sorry. And, for, and I also feel like um, when I get to the end of the short story, I understand that something was presented to me that was there the whole time, but I didn't have, you know, the full the full view of it. So it's sort of it's just a revelation to me that I'm like, oh, it was here. Oh, it was here all along, which is a very helpful um, centering. Feeling. Yeah, it's like a magic trick, yeah. right? That you're sort of like, wow, that just whoa, right? You know, like like, and you're just sort of like sitting in that joy of being surprised. But yeah, yeah, Jai, you know. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking, um, so the, the, the poet Tom Lux, the way he used to read his poems is he would kind of go line by line, and he would ask for each line, how do you feel? Mm -hmm. And so I suppose that a story that I love is one that maximizes my level of feeling, <laughs> you know, and... I love everything that you all have said. Um, it feels like I'm in a master class right now. And the other thing that comes to mind is this quality of honesty, which is that does it feel true from line to line, from moment to moment? You know, like does it feel internally consistent? Does it feel honest to the voice? Yeah. Um, so I know there were other hands that were up, and we have backup prizes here, um, which you will get a short story and a beautiful bookmark that has all the information about um, this. So, so, so some of the, somebody who had us had a hand up, what other questions are in the audience here? Yes. I was wondering if you ever feel that as you're writing a short story or when you've just finished, do you then think, oh, I actually have more to say about these characters and these events? And I want to turn this into a longer project. And like, how do you sort of decide as you're starting a writing project or idea the length that you think it's going to be? Or do you just kind of like take it as you, as you write? Mm. Have any of you had that experience of turning something? For me, they're very different, yeah. I will say. Like, I kind of enter something. I almost like as soon as I begin it, I know whether it's going to be a novel or a story. For, for, for me as well, I would say when I'm writing a short story, I kind of have like a, 
you know, like a running coach that's sort of like in my head that's like, okay, well, you need to pick up the pace here. You know, it needs to end at 5,000 words and sort of like is tracking with me to like, you know, like get me from beat to beat. Um, I, I will say that I gravitate towards novels more for ideas, like the largeness of the idea, whereas for the short story, I think about it more as like moments, um, which allows for a more discrete structure. How would you? I think, um, so um, it is a really different feeling in me. I've, I've now written three short stories, by the way. Um, <laughs> we are bringing you over. I'm doing yeah. it. I'm doing it. Um, but it is, I, I did try to write short stories um, in undergrad and, and always failed because I think my natural pacing is a novelist's pace. So, and all of my chapters are 30 pages long. Like, without fail, I will write something. I'll be like, and it's done, and it's 30 pages. And, and so I kept writing 30-page short stories that really didn't do the work that a short story needed to do, right? It was too flabby. And also, the other indicator for me that you're in a novel is that there are alleyways that you wander down that will have no resonance within the larger story, and that is actually the point. The point is the air. The point is the breath. The point is to go on that journey that doesn't necessarily inform the plot in a, in a way that it can, you know, without that it wouldn't be the same story. No, it totally would. You just wouldn't have gone down that alleyway. It's a different feeling. Um, so when I'm writing a short story, I definitely, I'm aware of the word limit the way that I'm aware of a ticking clock. Um, and sometimes I will impose that word limit on myself so that I will keep myself within the short story form so I won't write a 30 page chapter of something. I'd love to read a 30-page chapter of something that you wrote. I have a whole book for you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait, to, can't wait to read that. If, you, if it's possible that you're asking this question because you've written a story and that contains characters or something, a scene that you can't stop thinking about, I would pay attention to that instinct. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with everything that's already been said, and yet... There was a story in my first collection, Safe as Houses. The story is called, Sometimes You Break Their Hearts, Sometimes They Break Yours. It's about an undercover alien taking notes on human beings, an undercover alien girl who grows up in Northeast Philadelphia. After I wrote that story, <laughs> it's a memoir. After I wrote that story, totally true, everything is true. She literally faxes back notes on human beings. After I wrote the story, it's published everything. I couldn't stop amassing notes on human beings. So I opened up a Microsoft Word document and I kept writing notes like, when people say it's two sides of the same coin, it never is. <laughs> like, things like that. And I would write down like, why are there two words for it? Like it just, everything I would think. I couldn't stop thinking about her and her experience. Uh, very long story short, too late. Um, my next novel, Beautyland, which is coming out next year, is the novel version of that short story. But it is the only time that has happened to me so far. But I think like paying attention to that instinct and thinking, this isn't quite done with me yet. I wonder why. And being curious about it, I think, is really part of the great thing of what we do. Mm -hmm. So if that's happening to you, I'd follow it and see you know, what else might be there. That's such good answers, you guys. Great I, job. I would also add to that, I think there's a difference between that thing being in you, where you're like, That's a, this is true, I can't stop thinking about these characters, versus other people reading it and saying, reading a short story of yours and saying, I think this is a novel. If, if you get the feeling when someone says that to you and you're like, ugh, then it's not, right? It's very different from, I cannot stop thinking about these characters and I have to keep going with them. Yeah, it's an internal process and listen to that internal you know, clock. Um, I think we got time for maybe one or two more questions. So um, I've got more prizes here, um, which please come up and you know grab them after afterwards. Um, so so who else has a question? Hi everybody. I just wanted to hear if you could talk about what you've discovered about hearing your stories performed, and has that made you made any any changes in the way you think about writing? Um, just the idea of of something being spoken out loud. Um, for me, that we were talking about this actually at the last event that we did. Um, the first time it happened, 
I was like, it was an out of body experience. I think because when when you when you are the one who's reading your work, you're up on stage and you're so nervous, right? And you're kind of like blocking things and like the lights are right at you and you're kind of like focusing on Trish trying to breathe. Um, and you've practiced at home and you're kind of like you're, you're into your own performance. And sometimes you know I'm registering sometimes when people are responding or whatever, but you're like kind of very interior. But to be in the audience watching someone else perform, I was just like watching. I was like, oh, look, they laughed at that. Like, you know, like it was, it was really interesting to like sort of actually, you know, experience my work from that. That was what was, I think was so, you know, interesting. And like, and the first time it was like, I was, there was a few times where like the actor was doing something where I was like, I, that's not like how I, you know, I was a little like it was. And then the second time Laurie Anderson read it and I was like, I was like, you know, I already worshiped her and I just made me worship her more. Um, how about you, what, what, for, 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 what was it like when your work was performed? Yeah, so the story that was performed, I'd probably revised it like a thousand times. And when I heard it on stage, when Pavish Patel performed it, I felt like I heard all the ghosts of revisions past. I was like, wait, did I actually go with that line in the end? <laughs> um, and, you know, he, I think like he also discovered moments in the story that I was simply not aware of, which was really surprising to me. Like. And for example, like moments of humor, which I didn't think that story had that much humor, but he like brought it out. So I think that's a great gift of any actor that they can reimagine a piece of art. I'll just say that reading my work out loud is part of the revision process for me. And so I highly recommend it. Um, I insist that my students do it, like it's mandatory. Having someone read a story out loud, getting to listen to a story, let alone your own, is one of, I think, the joys of life. I am lucky enough to have a couple people in my life who have my favorite voices. They're not actors. They have my favorite voices. Um, one of them is a poet, and she's here, Sereng Wang Mo Dompa. I'm sorry, Sereng. But she has my fav one of my favorite reading voices of all time, and hearing a voice match a piece of either their own work or someone else informs my work to its core. And so um, I would suggest like amassing your favorite voices in your life and asking them to read you work, because that's, that's really fun. That's a great idea. Great idea, great idea. And you can do it for each other, you know? Um. Thank you all for being here. Um, my question is maybe a little esoteric, but I was thinking, listening to you talk about kind of economy and um, and how there's a limitation in short story on like just literal length. Um, I was wondering what that does to time in the story and how time functions. And I've seen short stories that do really experimental things with time and ones that are really time bound because of that tightness. So I was wondering sort of how you think about how temporality is working in your story given that constraint. That's actually one of my favorite things about writing short stories is that you have to accomplish so much. And so it forces you to do things like collapse time in ways you didn't think you would, and to pin things to certain moments to say like, this week this happened, the next week that happened, this week this happened, and then bring it back, like to kind of hold the beats of the story and cover huge swaths of time. Um, I would never have done that in a novel, right? I would never do that in a novel. Likewise, to take something and then slow it down a lot, a lot, so it can hold the full weight of the end of a short story, which is such a different thing than holding the weight of the end of a novel. The, the end of a short story matters more in some way to me. Like when I'm reading it, it matters more because of the proportionality of the thing. So I feel like the, the, the great thing that it does for me is it makes me take risks in language I wouldn't otherwise because because it's demanding an economy and it's demanding that I rise to meet what it's asking of me. It's like being on a tight wire for me. I would say that I am generally obsessed with time in fiction. Uh, so I, I love I love the question. I, I think that in short stories it's it is hard to move around with time as much as you can in a novel. I mean, because like of the fact that um, I think stories tend to have more of a discrete structure and, and that provides a kind of constraint. But I still remember like when I read the Monroe story, um, Axis, where she does a crazy flash forward at the end, um, that I was like, okay, 
this is absolutely possible, you know, in in the short form. And so, like, so I, I've really become interested over the last few years in actually like playing around with time and the short story, which I think is maybe less common, but I think is um, super exciting when it's available. I can't say it any better than what's already been said, but I will just share something I think about, a quote that I heard from one of the, uh, from Amy Hempel, an, a master of the short story, which was, sometimes you just have to get your characters in their coats and out the door. Meaning, using time, like many times we feel called to describe everything, and sometimes it's like, they wanted to go to Florida, page break, they were in Florida, in Florida, comma, and then instead of describing everything about the trip, I think sometimes we forget that we can manipulate time like that and time travel very quickly. Yeah, I'll just, you know, my, my, my only addition, there's a great, great, great comments, um, is um, the, the really cool thing about time is slowing it down. I find, you know, there, there's like the speeding up, you know, moving you through, like getting them to Florida like that, you know, but also that's the magic of a short story is it is about these like finding the pulse points of time in our lives where we experience something that like almost like drops us through the floor um, and our mind goes back to that, you know, moment again and again and you can kind of create that on the page. Um, by s making that slowing down that moment of time. And I think that for me, I mean, sometimes in film or like something, but like it's rare for that to happen for me outside of reading. Um, something that mirrors my own personal experience of experiencing time. So that's sort of like the magic. I call it, I call it like a, I always call it, I call it, for my students, I call it a close up. It's like you're going, <laughs> you know, like, like bringing it way, way, way in. And that's, that's, that's really, really fun. Yeah. Uh, earlier you were all met talking about how there are certain pieces of writing that you revisit from time to time, whether it's like your favorite pieces. Um, and Marie, I think you said that there was a specific author that you weren't ready for the first time you had read their writing. So William when Trevor, right? All of them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so when you're like revisiting these pieces of writing, is there a specific process or mindset you have going back into it, to, especially if you didn't like these pieces the first time around? Like, is there a way to go back into it um, to allow yourself not to be biased because you knew you didn't really like enjoy it the first time? I mean, yes, I have thoughts on that. I, um, I think that one of the great joys of, of doing something like that is um, it's really just curiosity, right? Once you understand what the components are and what the parts are and that we're all kind of working with the same parts, we're using them differently, you can be so curious about the choices someone made and think about their own inflection point, what their emotional temperature is, what the thing is that, it, it's, like, it's like trying to draw a portrait of a person backward. You read the thing and then you try to draw the person that made it. And I think that to me is always um, a great part of reading a short story I didn't understand before is looking at the choices the person made and trying to figure out the psychology behind those choices and the heart that built them toward this particular you know, structure. Like that to me is, it's, like a, it's a really wonderful moment to get deeply curious. Um. Ideally, you have some kind of guide or you hear something that allows you to, when you have a strong feeling about a short story one way or another, to get curious about that feeling instead of dismissing it. Um, I read the work of Lori Moore and really had a strong adverse feeling to her when I first read it. And I was pretty you know, vocal about my feelings when I was in school studying stories. So I, l I let it be known that I had trouble. And my very wise professor said, yeah, we always have trouble with the writers who are masters of what we are trying to do. Mm -hmm. And so instead of just letting me like rant and rave, he, I, he knew that it was because I was identifying something in her work that was in my work as well. And so ideally now you won't waste 10 years, you know, proclaiming that you don't like an author when really probably there, that author is meant to teach you something important that you're already maybe thinking about and trying to do. So I give that to you. I hope it, wor I hope it helps. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love that, Laurie Boer. <laughs> um, 
but they, I mean, like this, the Trevor story that brought me back to William Trevor is fully a do. And the way I think about these kinds of moments is they feel like unresolved relationships, like maybe like a teenage romance that you're like, well, I wasn't really ready to, to be in a relationship at that time. And that's how I felt about that particular story. Like it bothered me. Like I couldn't understand why, and, and it was a somatic experience. So like I could feel it in my body. Like I couldn't understand why it bothered me. And so like that curiosity, that sense of being bothered, I, I think is really important to sort of cultivate the attention toward the thing that bothers you, I think is helpful. And I think so sometimes like, you know, we're always changing as human beings, you know, as we gather experiences, as we go through different things. And sometimes there were certain writers that I just like, you know, I read them, but like they didn't do it for me. But then I maybe went back to them or tried, read them again 10 years later. And there was something about, I was like, oh, and it was because I wasn't, I wasn't at the place in my life yet that I could actually see or maybe understand even some of the experiences that they were talking about. So if there is somebody that maybe, you know, like keep them on your shelf for a while. Don't, 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 don't donate those books too fast. Like there might be a book there that you want to go back to um, and try again. And, you know, if it's second time, maybe third time, I don't know, or maybe, you know, before you give up on it, like try, try it a few more times. So um, I'm going to just sort of draw this to a close. Um, a little bit about a story about my experience with selected shorts that was important to me. Um, and that was... You know, there is something about that radio program, you know, when it was on the radio now on podcast. Um, I hope if you haven't listened to it, you'll just seek it out. Just literally Google Selected Shorts or you can listen to it or find where it's broadcast um, or download it as a podcast. Um, it's really great. And Meg Willitzer, the great writer Meg Willitzer, just took over as the new host. Um, she is not only a fantastic writer and great human being, but she also has a marvelous singing voice. So I'm excited to have a little bit of singing coming back into Selected Shorts like Isaiah used to do uh, before he passed away. So um, for me, you know, I, I listened to Selected Shorts um, at a time of my life where like, I, I was holding down like three jobs and it was on like Saturday nights from five to six and it was when I left my job as a cashier um, <laughs> at a bookstore actually going to my waitressing job which I started at six so I would every Saturday night I would just like drive my junked out old car um, and I would listen to selected shorts and um, and I would just like get I felt like I was in symphony space I felt like and I was like connected to this literary world in a way that I was very far away from at that time in my life but it made me feel not only connected to the literary world but it made me feel connected to like just the people sitting in the audience and there is something about that shared feeling of of, that's a little bit different of listening to an audiobook on your own. There's something different when you're listening to um, a story that's being por performed in front of a live audience. You can hear the size and the explanation, you know, the, you know, and you're like sort of, you know, exclaiming like along with everyone. You feel people shifting in their sheets and like it's just like it's a different feeling and it's, it was really, really powerful. Um, and for me, it made me feel closer to a life that I was very far away from. And so for me, that's when I was able to finally be a part of it. It just was, you know, blew my mind. Um, and so I just want you all to check it out. Um, I want you all to check this book out and also check out the books of these amazing writers um, who are so fantastic and so smart and shared so much wonderful wisdom here tonight. So um, Thank you all for being a part of the book. Thank you for coming. And thank you all for being a part of this. So um, come up and talk to us. We'll, we'll be doing a book signing up front. Um, for those of you who ask questions, come up and receive your prizes, which will be here on the edge of the stage. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you.